thank you all for coming to today's lecture at the Palestine Center and thank you to the Institute for Palestine Studies and Michel Esposito for um, partnering with us on this event. Um, I'd like to say that I'm, I'm Samira al Qasim. I'm the program manager here. Normally Zain Azam would be here. She is sick with the flu and she's very sorry to not be with us, but she will be back with us shortly. So today's event is entitled Wither the Children of the Stone, an Entire Life Under Occupation. And our guest speaker is Dr. Brian K. Barber who is currently a new fellow, New America Fellow in Washington, D.C., as well as founding director of the Center for the Study of Youth and Political Conflict at the University of Tennessee. Today, Dr. Barber will discuss what happened to the Shabab, the youth, who brought global attention to Palestine through their historically unparalleled activism during the First Intifada. They are now adults, and nothing they have fought for has come to pass. Dr. Barber will examine the situation by posing a series of questions about the first generation of Palestinians to live their entire lives under occupation. He will look at how the occupation has shaped their lives historically and at present, and how they feel about their present and future. To do this, he will draw on two sources. The first derives from intensive interviews he has conducted over the past two decades among the youth in Gaza. These narratives form the basis of a forthcoming book that he is writing during his fellowship at New America, tentatively titled, Imprisoned for Life, Coming of Age in the Gaza Strip. The second source for his presentation uses excerpts from his ongoing comprehensive study of the current well-being and life histories of 1,800 men and women of this generation who come from the West Bank, East Jerusalem, and the Gaza Strip. The findings of this unprecedented study conducted in 2011 have been most recently published in the Journal of Palestine Studies, copies of which are for sale and which you can purchase after the talk at that table by the door. As mentioned, Dr. Brian Barber is a New America Fellow in Washington, D.C. He is also a professor of Child and Family Studies and, as mentioned, founding director of the Center for the Study of Youth and Political Conflict at the University of Tennessee. His prime field of research has been Palestine, beginning with long residencies with families in or near refugee camps in the Gaza Strip after the ending of the first intifada, and where he has made many visits since. Dr. Barber is editor of the 2009 Oxford University Press volume called Adolescence and War, How Youth Deal with Political Conflict and a, there's a display copy of that up at the front desk. And his work on Palestinian youth has been published in many book chapters and scholarly articles, including The Lancet, Social Science and Medicine, Journal of Traumatic Stress, Global Public Health, Child Development Perspectives, Journal of Child Psychology, and Psychiatry and Human Development. His writings on Palestine have also appeared in Medium, New America Weekly, Muftah, Informed Comment, Alternate, and Open Democracy. Please join us in welcoming our speaker. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for taking the time to come. Um, thank you, Samira, for that nice introduction. Uh, I'm really happy to be here. I've been looking forward to this talk for some time now. And I, I need to start by acknowledging and thanking crucial partners. Uh, first, um, Zaina Azam, who unfortunately can't be here today, and Michelle Esposito for jointly sponsoring this conference, and all of their associates that have worked so hard to put this together. Um, I want to th also acknowledge and thank the Journal of Palestine Studies, whose associate editor Maya is here, and who has has uh, agreed and exacted the rigor necessary to publish um, a lengthy version of uh, some of the findings that I'll present today in the journal, which I'm very proud to to see here and available. I uh, have crucial partners that have subo supported this work over the last two decades. Um, uh, most prominently, I want to thank the Jakobs Foundation of Switzerland, who uh, gave um, incredibly generously, both in terms of funds and flexibility, to 
to conduct the project that I'll talk mostly about today. There have been the universities of Tennessee and Brigham Young University where I've been the last 20 years, the Social Science Research Council, the Jerusalem Fund, the Rockefeller Bellagio Italy Studies Center, New America, and the Foundation for Middle East Peace. My partners, um, I've had always had big teams doing this research, and I want to mention some of them. Clea McNeely at the University of Tennessee would like to be here today. Um, and she's been a critical partner all throughout the project I'll describe today. And then there are key advisors, many of whom you may know from Palestine, Rita Jakaman, Mahmoud Daher, Iyad El Saraj, Cairo Arafat, Mohammed Abu Malouh, and Khalil Shikaki and his Palestinian Center for Policy and Survey Research, which uh, was our partner in data collection. So when I talk, present the findings that I present today, all of those data were collected by his trained field workers in Gaza, East Jerusalem, and the West Bank, of course done in Arabic and uh, otherwise appropriately done. Mostly I want to thank the many Palestinians who have participated so eagerly and openly in these projects. If we count those who have participated in the formal research, that number reaches very nearly 10,000. I certainly know hundreds personally and many very intimately. And it's been a singular privilege for me in my life to be able to come to know this people who are, who continue to be tragically misunderstood by the outside world. It's been transformative at all sorts of levels. Um, I think you're an audience that doesn't need me to advocate for the need to pay attention to Palestinians, so I, I won't spend my time doing that. I assume that you have those sensitivities and work in, in various ways on behalf of bringing a better understanding about this people. Today I'm going to try to invite you to enter a different realm of trying to understand and uh, assist, and that is the realm of a researcher, uh, which is where uh, I obviously have spent uh, my time. As was mentioned in the introduction, the, the um, work has um, been very visible in academic uh, uh, outlets. These are some of the journals that we have recently published in, and that's, that's the book. Um, and so, you know, I, 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 could, I could very easily talk about the personal transformative, very interesting and compelling stories about what it's like for a, a middle class, uh, upper middle class Los Angeles wasp to go to Palestine and uh, end up being somewhat of an expert on a region that 20 years ago, 21 years ago, I could not have even pinpointed on a map. But, um, and that's enough. That would be, that would be very fulfilling, but, but it's been extra specially uh, satisfying for me to be able to have those experiences while at the same time fulfilling my professional role um, rigorously um, and being able to contribute I think measurably um, to, to various disciplines when it comes to doing research and understanding uh, people's lived experiences. So you need just a bit of background. Um, I won't tell those compelling stories, but I'm happy to answer questions uh, as you like to ask about how this got started and what it was like to uh, to live for long periods of time in Gaza, in, in refugee camps, in homes of families. This is a picture of the first family that I lived with in beginning in 1996. Um, that's an earlier version of me in the center. Uh, and that is the entire family. And the, the man to the right, the boy to the right then is one of the subjects of the book that I'm writing about and will briefly describe to you, just so that you can 
see a current view. That is Hamam, the boy to the right, uh, taken 10 days ago in Gaza at his home, uh, where I still stay when I go to Gaza. So this has been a very long-term relationship and, um, and, and in, an important set of experiences. Why I went, um, I'm not going to belabor that, uh, but it was not planned, it was not expected. Uh, it was serendipitous in, in every way. Uh, but I took it seriously in the end and um, dove in as deeply as I could. And uh, I hope that has given me some little bit of authority to talk from the outside about a people that are certainly foreign to my culture. The basic research question for me, I'm, I'm a social scientist interested in youth. Um, the reason I was reluctant to go to Palestine when first invited in 1994 was because I was engaged in studying youth in 10 cultures around the world already. I didn't have time, I didn't think, and I frankly didn't have an interest in the Middle East. So I'll confess that um, uh, reality of the day. Um, but my interest has always been young people, what makes them thrive, what, what stresses them, how do their contexts help them maximize their potential or get in the way. And I've studied that at various levels, um, family context, social context, neighborhood, and so forth. And so that been, has been kind of the basic driving question of this research as is, you know, what is it like for, what was it like for these youth to have lived six years of their formative years, their teenage years in, in frequent and intense conflict? What is that like? Why do they do that? What do they think about? Uh, um, why do some not do that? What are the effects on them? What are the benefits of that? What are the, the costs of that? And then, most importantly, what are the long-term impacts? Um, my profession, researchers are in some ways too much like journalists. Apologies to any journalists in the room, but. You know, we go from drama to drama. We, uh, we want to study things that, that feel important and crucial. And so most of the research that's done uh, by myself previously and my colleagues was um, to, to do a study of a youth population at crisis, try to capture their suffering and well-being and so forth, and then we m move on to, to the next hot, hot spot. But as you know, uh, the large majority of young people survive war uh, with their lives and surpri surprisingly uh, most with their mental health. So the question then becomes, all right, what becomes of them? What, how, are, how have these experiences dur during their formative years impacted their lives as they move forward? Is there an, uh, is there an impact on on the transitions to adulthood, on the achievement of cultural norms like marriage, completing education, having children, and so forth. These were the background questions that I've been wrestling with for these uh, many years. I have two parallel efforts on that front. Uh, one I'll talk about very briefly uh, is this, this book that I'm trying to write. Uh, this is a narrative nonfiction, so it's a new style for, for me to write, but it's and it's enormously difficult to do, but very fulfilling to do. It's progressing. I'm happy to talk to you about that. It uh, is essentially an entry into Gaza for those, most of the world who will never go. Um, and I tell it through the lens of a set of families that I have known quite well of at least the last 20 years, including Hamam and also Hussam. These are main characters because I know them very well. Um, and they are a very in interesting uh, juxtaposition. Uh, they are both Gazans, obviously. They're raised in neighboring refugee camps. Uh, Hussam still lives in the same home, in the same refugee camp that I first interviewed him in 20 years ago. 
Uh, they both have been fortunate enough to, to pursue their education. They both have PhDs, both in educational leadership. They both are still in Gaza, and they couldn't be uh, more different uh, at various levels. Intriguingly, uh, one level um, is their, their behaviors relative to the first intifada, Hussam. And as, as late as last night, I was going to include an excerpt from the writing, but I, I do know that I can't cover everything. So Hussam, uh, at 13 years old, was asking himself, Who, whose land is this? Is it, are the Israelis right? Are the Palestinians right? He went to libraries, and he, he researched this. He's a, he's a scholar by birth. And he made his commitment uh, as a young teenager that, yes, this is indeed Palestinian land, and therefore, he's a very logical guy, therefore his role was to try to achieve um, his land in whatever ways that his people uh, sought to pursue that. And he was an activist leader of the PFLP in his camp. He was imprisoned three times, and there are just lots of stories that, that that we'll, I'll be telling in this book about Hussam. Hamam shares to every degree that what we call master narrative that a Palestinian anywhere in the world shares, and that is the desire for, to, to be recognized as a people and to have a territory which can be called home. But Hussam, uh, Hamam um, made the opposite decision also as a young boy. He, he committed to himself that he would never engage in any confrontation with the Israeli soldiers. Why? I mean, he was as committed to the master narrative as Hussam. But for Hamam, uh, he was then reeling, and still in many ways is reeling from the agony of not having a father present in his very young years. His father, Fuad, was a political prisoner when he was a young boy. And this was excruciating for Hamam, such that he decided that he would never take the risk of having his son repeat that experience. Uh, Personality-wise, they couldn't be diff more different. Uh, ha ha Hamam, I even get their names mixed up. Hamam is boisterous. He's laid back. He's energetic. He's fun-loving. Hussam is the scholar, logical, programmed, very intelligent. And so the story of them, them their parents, their spouses, and their children uh, are going to be the core of, of this book that I'm going to try to do. Hopefully that's enough of a teaser to get a repeat invitation to come talk about, <laughs> talk about the book. So uh, the p other track, I said there were two tracks. Uh, the other is this uh, very large, very complicated research project that the Jacobs Foundation um, funded us to do. And that's where I want to spend uh, most of my time uh, today. Uh, these data were collected in 2011. So we just understand that they're already dated. Um, we have been publishing them in various places. but. Uh, those of you who know Palestine well uh, will know that everything that I'll present here um, logically has progressed over the last five years. So the hardships are predictably worse, and the strengths are also likely to be even increased. So I'm, I'm not that uncomfortable about the fact that these data are already five years old, but we do need to recognize that much has happened uh, since 2011, especially in Gaza, where there have been two further wars, uh, 2012 and 2014, the latter of which was um, cataclysmic in its impact on the Gaza Strip. And I'm, I, um, I, I neglected to bring you fresh greetings from Palestinians and Gazans. I was just there last week. And I'm happy to talk at length, as you wish, about what it, things are like on the ground now, but I'll leave that for, you, for your curiosity later. 
So this is that generation. This is, these are the kids that you remember seeing on our TV screens. This is my, uh, my photo of some of them back uh, then 20 years ago. And these are, the, these are the young people who now are 40 years old-ish, late 30s, early 40s. And we studied them in 2011, so as adults. We wanted to know the long term. You know, what are they doing? What, how is life as an adult after you spent your youth in such chaos? Uh, but we also then pieced together their major life events from 1987 to 2011. So we, we have, through a very sophisticated methodology, which I'm happy to answer questions about before, uh, able to piece together the trajectories of their lives since the first intifada and how how their lives have played out, uh, timings of their marriages, children, and so forth, their exposure to political violence, their activism, uh, you name it, so from 87 to 2011, that 25 year period. Uh, so we all know that, that that's an important generation. Uh, historically, um, it still is uh, unique. There has not been a population documented that I know of where our youth, or youth have participated as actively in political matters than Palestinians of the First Intifada. But I wanted to just show you um, a little of uh, the data. And I'll try to walk you through this. But these are the, that generation retrospecting on their degree of activism across their lives. So the first two bars are summaries for West Bankers and combined with East Jerusalem, and I can explain later why we couldn't separate out East Jerusalem in this case. And then the second bar, um, Gazans. And so you see in the first two bars that there's a slight higher activism rate in Gaza than in the West Bank and East Jerusalem. Uh, but more importantly is the absolute value. So you have, and if you take the third bar here, males, these are males in East Jerusalem and West Bank, 75% of them were engaged uh, in some way, in some level of activism. And I can talk to you later about what those specific things are, but this is a catch-all of, of more than a dozen types of activism that they could have done. So 75% um, during the first intifada, and the, this bar is not yet females, but I, I, I put males again here. And so the 75% and the 43% and the 46% are if you ever did anything during those periods, even one thing, like throw stones or demonstrate whatever. This fourth bar are those males who did it, reportedly did it very often or regularly. And that's an astoundingly high figure, 40%. Typically, the maximum figure I've seen of a youth population who ever does anything, let alone does it frequently and very often, is about 25%. So you've got 40% here of males uh, doing it very often. And then and you see that that stays that goes way down in the Oslo period, as we would expect it to go down, uh, but then back up to 18% in the second intifada. These are, these are new data. We, um, we, we have some data about the first intifada rates in various outlets, but there haven't been good data about activism during the Oslo period and thereafter. They're in, they're in this sample if their age during the first intifada included three years of their adolescence. So they, during the, the first intifada, they had to have been a teenager. And these data were collected now, or 2011, when they are nearly 40. So it, it is a generation. No, these are the same individuals, same individuals. Yeah, thanks for that question. And then noteworthy here is the blast bar, which is the female participation rate. 
you know cultural norms and uh, typically one expects that females in a, a culture like Palestine are more inside, uh, in, not front stage, but, but uh, at least 42% were doing something. Uh, during the first intifada, also up to 20% during Oslo even, and as many as 20% in the second uh, intifada and after. So um, that speaks, I mean, what my main message for this chart is that yes, indeed, these were, uh, this is a generation of young people who were indeed very active, not just in the first intifada, but significant proportions of them thereafter. So this political activism has really sh been part of their lives uh, for the whole of their lives. So I want to engage you in an exercise. Um, oh dear, look at my watch. I'd like to ask you if you'd think about two people you know very well, and one of whom is doing pretty well in life, and the other one is not doing well. And, and if we had time, I'd ask you to describe those people, literally. And you'd, you'd, ask, you'd answer first with kind of archetypes, so-and-so, uh, and, so, and I'd say, no, no, I want specific people that you know, and so forth. Um, that's the method, the first question we had to face as researchers when our task was to understand the adult functioning of this young group of, of former, uh, long-term activists was how to, what is it that we measure? What do we, what do we want, how do we capture the quality of life? I mean, what is quality of life or well-being in uh, Palestine, in Gaza? Um, and, uh, so that was the method that, that we used. We literally asked uh, groups of young people from West Bank, East Jerusalem, from Gaza, refugees, non-refugees, males and females, Fatah and, and Hamas in Gaza, these, this very grounding question so that we could understand uh, what, it, um, what, what it is that they understand to conceive a good life and a bad life. I want to raise more quickly than I plan to. Um, the takeaway is that it revealed a, a dimension of quality of life or well-being that we don't ever study, frankly. We as public health people or mental health people, it's, it's not a surprising finding, but these, these people nominated more often than anything else by far some element of the political context in their descriptions of someone who on a day-to-day -day basis was doing well or not well. I mean, that's, that's profound for, for all sorts of reasons and audiences. Um, and I can't spend as much time on it as I wanted to, but this is, oh, why do I do that? So this is our, our conceptualization, conceptualization of that, this was published in Social Science Medicine, which is a very highly respected journal, and the fact that they would give this much journal space to a Palestinian population is itself rewarding. But the takeaway here is that uh, if, you, if you really are concerned, if we really are concerned about improving the lives of this population, uh, it really is the context, the political context that matters. I mean, we can tweak it but with economic aid, we can tweak it with mental health therapies, but they tell us, this is their report, not my uh, analysis, their report, that really what determines whether they're having a good day or a bad day, or whether they're suffering or not suffering, is some element of this political relationship that they have with um, the Israeli uh, occupation forces. Well, how do they suffer? I mean, we are all rightfully concerned about the mental health of any population who experiences stress. Um, and we probably, if we had more time, I'd ask you, what, what do you think? What, are, what, what, what do they feel? What do, what do they, they, they most uh, worry about and what do they suffer? 
And we talk about depression and PTSD. Uh, those are concepts which um, are debated as to their cultural relevance. They're Western concepts, but, but they are relevant in, in certain ways to even this population. But we heard something uh, very different from these interviews. Uh, we heard people talk about a type of mental suffering which, which wasn't on the list of indicators of these. So depression, you know what, how we think of depression, being sad, being feeling blue, uh, extra, extra tired, and so forth. PTSD is do you have reflections on traumatic moments? Do you avoid certain places? Do you have nightmares? Those elements were not discussed so much when people were describing a good person functioning well and a person not functioning well. What was described uh, were adjectives or nouns like this, feeling broken, feeling shaken, destroyed, crushed and exhausted. Those are unusual descriptions of mental health, at least as far as, as the way we've measured it in the past. And so we took this quite seriously and we, um, let, me, let me have you read this and I'll take a drink. one quick example of, of one of the excerpts that we, we found interesting and we coded to, to um, capture this type of, of mental suffering. And we wrote uh, then new items to measure this in, in the big survey of nearly 2,000 people uh, of that same co age group. Um, and this has worked empirically. It's worked lovely. It's about to be published in, in PLOS One. And so uh, I'll talk about implications in a minute, but I want to give you this overview again of prevalence um, because these are also new, uh, these are new data, even though that they are 2011. So here is the broken and destroyed construct. These are people, again, the same group of nearly 2,000, almost 40 year olds, reflecting on how often in the last two weeks they felt these ways, right? So if you were the respondent, the question is how often in the last two weeks have you felt broken or destroyed? And these bars represent those people who say off, who said often or regularly during the last two weeks. So fully 40%, this first bar is West Bank, the middle bar, East Jerusalem, the last bar, West Bank. These are astonishing, I'm sorry, Gaza, thanks. These are astonishingly high numbers. Four in 10 people uh, report feeling broken or destroyed often in the last two weeks, if you think, if you think that through. And here are the, in the levels of depression somewhat lower. Um, another important takeaway from this chart is notice that it's often the West Bank which is higher. And one, mis one mistake that we, we make too often in our love for Gaza is to overlook the fact that Palestinians in East Jerusalem and the West Bank have very severe suffering as well, and for somewhat different reasons, and that's important. We cannot, we can't neglect them. Uh, this is, I should say, this is not in the last two weeks feeling fearful. This is ever, so it's a, it's a little bit, it's higher because of that reason, but still astonishingly high. Now I want to, I want to drive that home even more clearly. This is the same question, but we are documenting those who, who said they, they felt it at least once in the last two weeks. So everyone other than who said never. <clears throat> Fully 94% of Gazans said that they experienced it at least once in the last two weeks, felt broken or destroyed. And this is 2011. You can imagine what it might be now uh, after the war of 14. I, I have to move on. These are astonishingly high figures, and very worrisome figures, and they have only increased in their severity, I, I can promise you. We were trying to get funding to do a follow-up of, of this study, um, but we, and we will then verify that, but I can promise you that they're only more severe.
one other question we ask is, um, you know, we, we focus a lot in social and uh, medical sciences on uh, violence. You know, we, we all know that violence is not ideal and it's difficult and and but we don't often ask the question of well um, are all violent exposures the same is it equally as risky to to be close to a bomb when it goes off as it is to have soldiers come and raid your home in the middle of the night are those equivalent they're both political violence and so one analysis that we've done that was also just published in uh, social science and medicine just a month ago uh, was to tackle that question uh, um, about looking at specific types of political violence and tracking their impact o over time. First, let me just show you the prevalence figures again. These are also, un there are no data like these, but you can see these are types of political violence that they report having experienced. This would be any time since 1987, and it could be as little as once, but you have virtually 90% of, of um, West Bankers and Gazans, nine in 10 people having had that experience once in their life. Now psychiatrists get worried about even one ex experience of that being a trauma. You can imagine then if you follow that logic, uh, you, you know, I can tell you that many of these experience have experienced that multiple times. And just go through, home raided. A home raid occurs in the middle of the night, usually 2 a.m. Soldiers break down the door. They come in, they roust a young boy out of his bed and do various things to him in front of his parents and often yank him off to prison or detention for a while. Uh, we, we all know that this has happened. We know that it happens, every army does this. United States Army does this. Uh, we know that it happens a lot uh, in, in Palestine, but, but now we know uh, much more clearly just how much. To me, it's, it's, it's astounding that eight in 10 people uh, have had that experience, even just once in their life, to have your home, the sanctity of your home violated in such a brutal way. And then you go down, of course, the prevalence of these are different, but still, half or more people having been shot at, being hit or kicked, detained or imprisoned, Th these are gender specific, these, these, actually these last three, these are mostly males, I mean relatively few females uh, experience this, but fully 25% of males of this generation, those who are now 40, have been imprisoned for some length of time, one in four people. So that's prevalence, but the question further is then, okay, well, what are the effects of these and does one matter more than the other and I'm going to show you no I'm not going to show you that because it'll confuse you let me just let me just say that the essence of this paper which was just uh, published um, has really really turned the tables on the understanding of of the relative injury to a, a person of exposure to typical or to various types of violence Typically, we think that the more dramatic, the more physically impactful being hit, being uh, tortured, being imprisoned, are going to be the worst traumas. What comes very clear in these data are that the worst traumas, the people who are suffering, suffering the most, are those who have been humiliated, which means verbally abused in this case, or seeing someone close to you humiliated. We're now, we've now documented that, and I won't confuse you with the complicated table, but it's, it's really, <clears throat> it, it's really, if I might say, it's very meaningful because um, finally we'll acknowledge professionally and uh, that, that, that the violation of a person's dignity and worth and identity, which is which is the strategy of humiliating treatment, is over the long term um, much more difficult to handle than having been tortured or imprisoned or so forth. And um, therefore, um, you can imagine the policy implications of, of that uh, realization. Uh, there's some happy news. Uh, I'm, I'm 
not too far behind. I, I need to add one thing. Uh, no, I won't. <laughs> I just can't. So there's some there's some heartening news. Uh, these are reported levels of family functioning. So satisfaction levels with family are very high. Quality of marriages are being reported to be very high. Virtually 80% of the sample is married and has children. So, um, and this, this, this brings to fore the, the often noted paradox in Palestinian experience, the dramatic levels of suffering and hardship, but at the same time, really impressive social um, tightness. This figure is less than we'd hope, but still more than half of people in 2011 felt a sense of community belonging, uh, which, which isn't anywhere near what the ideal would be, but it says something that there is still that much integrity left in the uh, society. Okay, I'm gonna close very quickly on um, these, the question about, okay, how do they think about their past? These are now 40 year olds, 2,000 of them roughly, um, when we ask them to retrospect on the meaning of several things in their life, including the role of the first intifada, so this is they're reflecting back 25 years now. You know what? What does this? What do you think about this? Still, 91 percent credit that experience as being valuable and worth it, and very few uh, view it as uh, regret having participated in it despite the obvious fact that it has not produced any virtu virtually any positive results for them. They view it as having been enhancing that first formative period. They also view it as having some negative impact on their lives, of course. and then their perspectives on the future. Of course, they're, this is 2011 again, uh, but still minorities expecting success, smaller uh, minority willing to participate, fairly pessimistic. And I highlighted, just because I want to end on a positive note here, that still 70% of this uh, beleaguered generation, can we say, uh, are hopeful that they can manage whatever's coming their way. And this is a, a good, good way to challenge us all again with this paradox of how, how or this illustration of how remarkably a population can uh, endure experiences that are chaotic, troublesome, violent, uh, humiliating, etc., and still feel the power, the energy, the um, wherewithal to, to move forward. And this is, this is kind of magical. I can say that that, I can promise again that if we were to do that survey today, that those rates would be somewhat lower. Um, and in Gaza, maybe dramatically lower, but still I would guess uh, more a, a small ma a majority. So um, I, I don't think I need I think I've kind of summarized there, and I, I, I think I need to stop. Um, I, I, I will tell you if you want to know about this lovely meeting we had in Gaza just 10 days ago. It's a beautiful gathering of 800 Gazans who came to hear about mental health. But um, uh, let me leave it there, and thank you again very much for your presence and your attention, and I'm really happy to try to answer anything that you might want to ask. Yeah, I have two questions. One is, um, what is the peer pressure like from the youth to, uh, to have to participate in being an activist 
And the second is, how do the Palestinians view Israeli-Palestinians? Aha, uh -huh. wow, both excellent questions. The peer pressure thing is, is very interesting. It is at one level what we would expect it to be high. So there were in the first intifada, which I know a lot about, have, having interviewed in depth these young people then. But there was also a maturity that evidenced itself where people would say, young people would say, you know, I, I have the right to, to contribute in my, in my way. And I, I, I'm not, I'm not going to be a stone thrower, but I'm going to bring onions to the, f the front lines. The onions is an antidote for tear gas. Uh, so there was, there was some, um, even at that young age, some, some ability to, to not cave completely to the pressure. Uh, and, and, but uh, very, uh, it would be the rare person who didn't want to participate. But uh, what I'm saying is that there was some autonomy in deciding the particular method that they wanted to participate in. As to their view of um, Palestinian cities, uh, citizens of Israel, Israeli Arabs, there are various ways to refer to them. There's very little discussion uh, in the, the territories that I've heard about them. They're, they are not, they're not often part of the, the narrative that you hear of uh, when they talk about the future or the need for Palestine. Now, if you were to ask them, you know, what about your brothers and sisters in Nazareth or um, other cities like that, Haifa, uh, they would immediately, of course, f express allegiance and care. And I suppose, and I'm just guessing here, that some might say or feel that, well, their life is maybe a little better than ours because at least they have a passport, at least they can travel. So there be multiple levels of feelings. It doesn't come up naturally, but if you pushed it, you would get multiple levels. There are brothers, but we've got it rougher. <laughs> yes, sir. Thank you very much. You said you would tell us some more about Hamam. Hamam, uh huh. Hamam, the one who said he would not confront the Israelis in any way. Uh, please do so. You're, you're interested in, in yes. uh, that, that is an, uh, kind of a surprising uh, stance. I'm, I'm guessing you're thinking that, that, that he decided not to do that. Yes, it, well, yeah. and uh, well, in any population, you're going to get some people. Uh, so so uh, what did he mean by not confront? in any way, how successful is he today, how positive is he today, or the mm -hmm. reverse? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, thanks f uh, for that. Uh, he, it, what he meant was that he would, he would never uh, go to a demonstration. He'd never put himself in a public situation where he might be arrested or detained. How successful, it's, and, and he did that, he never did. But uh, that doesn't mean he, he wasn't. So there are all sorts of stories, including very distressing stories from him, where he was detained for fabricated reasons and mistreated and so forth. But he was generally successful at avoiding, he was never, he was never detained more than a couple of days. Usually a detention is 18 days, and then next year imprisoned for three months and nine months. He never had any of those long detention, so he was successful at that. His motivation was very clear. Uh, he so suffered in his mind from the absence of his father when he was a little boy, which included a lot of marginalization from his peers at school. He didn't understand as a six-year-old the symbolic value of a father being a political prisoner. All he knew was that people were taunting him about, well, where's your father? Why don't you have a father? What's wrong with you? Oh, he's in prison? What's, you know, this kind of uh, degrading type discussion. So he had no protection uh, at that young age, and it hurt him just deeply. Uh, and uh, he simply refused to threaten his future sons with that possibility that he wouldn't be available for them. He's fine, uh, you know, he's happy-ish. Happy He's a uh, he's, um, uh, head teacher, so a, a principal of a boys' school in his 
in his town, Chen Yunus. He's also, he lectures at uh, two of the universities. He's just getting his PhD in educational leadership. Uh, he's very busy, and if we had another hour, boy, uh, he's also a Muktar, which is the tribal leader. And um, boy, the stories he has to tell about his responsibilities on a daily basis, answering phone calls from members of his family who have been in a skirmish with another family. He's the judge, and he's fascinating stories. And so he has that added role. So um, as you may guess or, or may not know, Gazans are, at least those who are fortunate enough to have employment, are enormously busy people, just working, working, working. Um, and in Haman's case, it's not just being head teacher and lecturing and finishing his PhD, but he has this layer of, of this really burdensome role, and that he would agree with that characterization of being a Mukhtar. Yes, sir. Oh, sorry. <laughs> See you way over there. Um, so I have a, a, a couple quick questions. Within the social sciences, there's always this debate on what's more valid, uh, quantitative or qualitative research. And, and what you've taken is something very qualitative and in really interesting and successful ways, I think, quantified it. Um, it, no, but no matter what, it, a lot of researchers often come under what is often well-coordinated attacks on their research if they study Palestine and write about it. So I'm wondering if you and your research team has um, been criticized because of your topic and how you're approaching it and, and um, presenting it. And I'm also interested, you, you talked about this research as, as being meaningful near the end. Um, I'm wondering if you personally as a researcher, if the other topics or geographic areas you've studied and researched have affected you in the same way, if this has been more uh, impactful on you as a, as a person, as a researcher. Thank you. Thanks for both of those questions. Uh, one of the things that we, we are very pleased uh, uh, and part proud about is that the, the pushback um, that often comes when you know, talk or publish about Palestinians has been very light. Um, one of the Lancet articles we published a couple of years ago about the humiliation um, generated a very fiery response from, from uh, I think they told me, 30 pages of emails. And they decided to publish one of them uh, from a professor in Canada who took issue with the findings and gave uh, us a chance to respond. And so there's, there's this this back and forth in, in Lancet. Um, and we, you know, we dealt with that, I think, professionally and competently. The, the, the criticisms were uh, documentably unfounded, and we were able, gratefully, to point them out. I'm sure there is, I, I have received a, a hate mail, which was grotesque, uh, but only one. That's not much in 20 years. Uh, but we're proud of the fact that, you know, social science and medicine and, and, and Lancet, um, those are big time outlets. And editors don't devote journal space to something that they don't really esteem as being useful. And the fact that they have devoted, in one case, the first social science and medicine piece gave us 50% more pages than they, uh, they, they allow for an article, it speaks, I think, speaks highly for the credibility of and the integrity of the research process, while at the same time it it provides an outlet and communicates a voice for these people um, more broadly than before. Your second question, uh, no, the other regions haven't impacted me as much as this one, in part because I haven't spent so much time there. Um, if we had more time, I could talk about comparisons with Bosnian youth that I made early on that helped me understand, you know, how it is that young people fare so well in these circumstances. But, um, and I've been to, you know, m many meaningful cultures, had many hours of talks with um, Bangla youth, South African black youth, you name it, and moving, powerful experiences. But this has just been so so enduring that um, uh, given my determination to stay there that, that it has higher levels of meaning.
Hi, I'm uh, Phil. Live nearby. Um, your your data breaking things down into the very specific things that affect people, such as being uh, soldiers breaking into your home, and I, it's, it's 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 very graphic and very believable. I wonder if you could look at the past 12 months uh, where it almost seems that uh, Palestinian youth are throwing themselves at soldiers, policemen, uh, militia, whatever, uh, st stabbing with, with scissors and things that are almost suicidal. Are these things exaggerated? Are they to be expected? Uh, uh, is there anything to improve in the near, near time? Thank you for, for that. Um, uh, this is a difficult to talk about. I mean, I think mostly the incidence of them is probably valid. There, there are certainly instances where knives have been planted, um, like our police do. But um, uh, by and large, I'm sure that most of these reports of uh, stabbings uh, are did, did occur. And you were you were right, I believe, to characterize that as um, suicidal. I, if speaking for them. I, they would say uh, martyrdom. But you're right in, in, in that it's obvious that they certainly know by now that if they're going to do that, they're going to be shot dead. That's this been documented. So in my view, this is, this is the, the newer age version of the suicide bombing of the second intifada in 2000. It's, for whatever reason, a small segment of this population and other populations decide that dying is is the way forward for them, um, whether that's because they can't take life anymore or because um, they think they can make more of a contribution if they do some injury to the opponent. Um, so I think that's the way I, I view it, that, that there is this small segment that is are the new martyrs. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it seems to be subsiding some, but there's no pr predictability about when it might surface again. And it's noteworthy. Um, one thing I didn't cover in the findings I raced over was uh, it's noteworthy this is happening in Jerusalem mostly and Hebron. It is, in fact, Hebron and Jerusalem where most people say they've been humiliated. There are more checkpoints. There are more obstructions. If you've been to Hebron and East Jerusalem, it's 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 bizarre uh, how complicated it is to 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 go to the grocery store to do something. So it's no surprise to me that this n new wave of desperation is occurring uh, more uh, in those two areas. I, I really think the young people who have never had a chance to envision any type of future and, and have no collective memory of fighting you know, for the struggle, um, they're, they're hopeless and don't see a future forward. Am I I feel that in Jerusalem and Hebron there are really invasions of space, um, you know, where soldiers and settlers come into schools while children are in school, they sit on the stairs, they have their lunch, they strut around, there's no separation. Um, and in Hebron it's, it's very bad that way, I mean the, the level of invasiveness. Yeah. Um, on a very, you know, minutiae level of everyday life is so great um, that yeah. it has to be, I'm sure there is a color correlation. Yeah, and, and the, I'll just thank you also for in, uh, underscoring the message that in our love for Gaza, we dare not ignore people who in some ways are suffering uh, much more critically, and that would be Hebron and East Jerusalem, and in some cases, the villages of the Jordan Valley. Um, on that same note, um, I'm wondering, you've talked about humiliation, and, and the image that's created is of a person being humiliated. But I would think that just as uh, difficult for children would be seeing their parents humiliated. And I wonder if that has had an effect over the years, and what impact that might have on the children of today. Yeah, that's that's a, a good and perceptive question. Quite literally, the two items we use to measure 
humiliation were being verbally abused yourself and secondly witnessing someone close to you being humiliated so that is very much captured in the conclusions that i've communicated to you here about the the particular injury of being humiliated and, and witnessing it especially to someone close to you um, who who you believe needs to be honored especially because he's your father or your mother even and as well um, that's crucial so it's just it's not just the personal experience it's the witnessing that is um, worrisome I just had a question about um, when you were looking at this cohort of, of youth that you studied over this period of time and you break it down and dive into those numbers, um, are you seeing correlations between certain of those indicators and the outcomes that these youth have experienced in their lives? Um, you know, just they're, wondered if you current, could... Their current, their current quality lives. of life. Yeah. Yeah, I, I really appreciate that question because also incorporated in that conclusion about the particular injury of humiliation is is the documentation that those, the, the empirical documentation in the data that th those of the 2,000 people in this study who were persistently humiliated over the last 25 years compared to those who had even more radical and harsher experiences during the intifadas, but this, there's a group that were persistently humiliated. Documentably, they are suffering uh, widespread economically, socially, psychologically. But to raise the paradox again, they're also they also report better marriages and more social cohesion. Right? So there, you know, there there is this still up there, 2011. There's still this cohering reaction to f to hardship I uh, have one comment and one question and my comment is um, when I was in Palestine a couple of years ago uh, the one time that I was there I took a, uh, a shuttle from Ramallah to Hebron and I remember riding with the, some of these the younger adults and uh, one of them made a comment that stuck with me that he said uh, that at this point we're basically willing to accept not even having a life it's just basically something like a life you know if it could get to that point then then that would be okay and just kind of horrifying and sad and yeah. um, my question is um, there was I believe there was one slide about how people felt uh, whether they made an impact uh, being participating in the first intifada and I, my understanding is it's kind of a general perception that, you know, the first intifada got it to the point where there were these, you know, the negotiations, you know, for Oslo or something, and that just, you know, the impact of that fell flat, you know, that didn't respect Palestinian rights and didn't uphold international law. And so uh, there was that movie, The One at 18, hmm. and from, that focused on Bet Zahur, and the takeaway from that was a lot of people thought that just their efforts were, were wasted, you know. They put themselves on the line and nothing came out of it. The, the leadership failed. So uh, did you get any sense of people's views on the leadership, Palestinian leadership? And then also, I would just like to add also the United States role, which is just bankrolling the occupation right. and settlement. Um, I really appreciate the, the your question because um, we can't, we also cannot ignore the fact that uh, there is there are extreme divisions uh, amongst political factions, especially in Gaza between Fatah and Hamas. I don't I can I can document that from my own observation, but from the reports of these people who are describing well-being and quality of life, from Gazans were repeated examples of the political core that had to do with the political infighting in Gaza. So. Um, and this is all, you know, partisan. So it, Os when Oslo was signed, um, most would say regrettably now, uh, it was hailed by Fatah members who believed Arafat was uh, the way to go. And it was, it was loathed immediately by every other faction. 
Um, and so it, uh, there, there are stark political divisions within, and depending on who's, who has power, there still is a continued insistence on exercising that power against your fellow brothers uh, brutally. And so there's this revenge dynamic going on still. Uh, and that's, that's a huge part of this that we dare not ignore as well. By, by far, the heavier burden is on Palestinians is placed by the occupation. But there are internal difficulties that are severe and are, are real obstacles to, to progress. And I hope that was part um, uh, an answer, answer your, to your question. But it's it kind of profound that you, you saw that most of them still valued their participation. I mean, these are, this is a cross-political party. 90% said, yeah, that was worth it. That's, that, that was surprisingly high to me because I know so many who who obviously know that it, it didn't work. The first intifada didn't achieve its aims. Ah, well, we're, I mean, that take another three hours. I mean, it's just, it's, it's quite obvious. I mean, we, we can hear it from the mouths of our leaders and future leaders. Um, so, I mean, if, if, I mean, I'd rather a answer that, you know, what, what do the locals feel about it? Oh, was that your question? Oh, thanks. Uh, part of the reason I've stayed so long and, and, and love this part of the world so much is the ability of people to not hold me responsible for the actions of my government. And that, that was palpable from the beginning, from day one, and still is. It's, it's harder for them to ignore uh, the pernicious effect of uh, decisions made by our government, my government, and many others. But it hasn't, it hasn't stained uh, irreparably their ability to um, distinguish the individual from the personal. There is, there is unambiguous uh, uh, feelings of, of bitterness and resentment towards the United States, and that's that is absolutely uniform. And they would uh, they would impress you with very articulated lists of reasons why policies and UN resolutions and you name it. Um, but they also um, well, they they would love it if any of you came to Gaza. They would just love it if you came. So, again, Pal Palestine is complex. You know, there, there are always two, two levels or sides. Yeah. Uh, oh. Right. So I, I think I have a pretty good window on. Let's complain it to Gaza like your question. I have been there. Okay, I'll start with Gaza. But, you know, I have been there a lot um, over the last 20 years, so I've watched it grow. I think I have a, a seasoned view. And I've always been, as my close friend and mentor, Jim Yunus, who's in the back row here, knows and has supported. Um, he actually was in the same room 18 years ago when I stood here and gave a talk. Uh, that uh, comment uh, to his loyalty, uh, his support for this work, and he knows uh, better than anyone how optimistic I've been, how much I've been impressed with and endorsed the hardiness, the strength, the resourcefulness of Palestinians. Uh, I. I can't, I can't do that any longer. The last war in Gaza was a thousand times <clears throat> more destructive to the psychology and the perspectives on the future than any of the previous wars. And so it's a very sad thing for me to go now because I see it in, in their eyes. Um, 
i had a young seventeen year old approach me at the end of this conference and he said are you a psychologist i said yeah he says i'm i'm struggling with depression i mean it's even to the point where young males are willing to acknowledge that they're having depression and he went through his symptoms and and we had a lovely talk but uh, just uh, just imagine he and um, any young person in Gaza has never left that strip of land in their life never once gone out anywhere you, you in the middle of Gaza if you're on a hill you, you can see its borders it's that small you can see the beach and you can see the uh, fence and the partially wall it's a very you know it's and it's crammed in in parts of it so uh, what would we expect I just asked rhetorically uh, of people who literally have not had the permission or opportunity to go anywhere other than another refugee camp or a or Gaza City uh, so the young people are rightfully in in great despair and and have no evidence that, that life will improve so it's it's really a marvel that there are more that are self-destructing the suicide rate is going up in Gaza um, not the martyr I'm not this is the suicide part not the martyrdom part I mean it's going up and people are very worried about it uh, but it's it's totally predictable I believe we have time for one more question and we'll finish yeah coming back to your presentation uh, I was som somewhat surprised by your finding concerning the satisfaction with the marital life mm -hmm. because it has been quite well documented that violence inside the family has been uh, increasing in a dramatic way you know, and this is uh, another consequence of uh, the, the confrontation to the bad uh, circumstances uh, families have to cope with. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, uh, I, I was also surprised that the rates were that high. And my first response would be simply to say this is, this is what they reported. Uh, and we didn't ask them about negative things in the home we asked about satisfaction so we saw the high rates and then we asked them about these indicators of marital functioning which they had told us in the interviews were important you know there probably is some social desirability in that that means you answer positively because you want to uh, people to think you're answering that way um, i suppose had we asked them um, about violence within the home um, they would have reported prevalence of it um, I, I'm not I, I'm aware of, of, of data which has documented uh, violence in homes um, uh, and I, I don't really have an answer as to why they would why they would rate it this way except that it is at some level an indicator that that they do find some positivity and strength in their their family and marriage relationships.